Hello, 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 hello. Welcome back to Coastal Insight Season 3. Uh, I'm super excited for this episode. Hello, my name is Makai Sharp. Uh, I am one of your hosts for uh, Coastal Insight Season 3. I'm currently casting from Treaty 6 territory, uh, which is the encompassing traditional lands of the Cree, Salto, Diné, Dakota, uh, Lakota, Nakota, and Métis nations. And joining me today is the other uh, co-host for Season 3, Arian. What's up, everyone? Uh, my name is Aryan Tomar. I am an international student studying at Pearson College UWC on the unceded territory of the Chianu Beecher Bay First Nation. Uh, and I'll be your co host for the rest of the season with Makai. Now, for those joining, um, feel free to drop in, in the chat uh, where, you're ca where you're tuning in from. Uh, we'd love to get an idea of just you know, how far we're, we're reaching and where people are coming from. That would be awesome. Great. Well, um, while that while that starts and and viewers continue to trickle in, I'll kind of do our little intro. Um, so, like I said, this is season three of Coastal Insights. This is episode two, um, and this season of Coastal Insights is all about hope, equity, uh, and advocacy in a world changed by the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, this episode is navigating uh, the media in an in the era of misinformation. Um, and so the way the rank coast and the, we've put it collectively is that, you know, media and social media can be extremely powerful tools to create positive change. But on the other side of the coin, um, the manipulation of these tools for political, economic or social gain is common. Um, so making media literacy more important than ever uh, is essential. And misinformation specifically around climate change, uh, social justice, and avenues community resilience have in many instances uh, stimulated our ability to take action and have created a feeling of helplessness, hopelessness and, you know, depression like we talked about last week. Uh, you know, being constantly plugged in can be detrimental to developing a genuine connection to nature and to people. Um, some, yeah. So how can we equip our youth with skills to navigate online spaces that can often be dominated by fake news and misinformation? These are kind of the questions that we want to be asking um, in this episode. So I'll pass it back to Arian to kind of talk a little bit more about um, who our partners are for the season. Awesome. And just quick shout out to Vanessa uh, tuning in from the uh, SFU Burnaby campus. Um, and Brenda, thank you for sharing just where you're at. We love to see, see that kind of engagement. Um, but this season is a partnership between Raincoast Conservation and Take a Stand Youth for Conservation. Uh, Raincoast is a group of humans, researchers, scientists, and conservationists based on Wasanish territory who are doing incredible work and confronting some of the very real problems facing our diverse ecosystems in the province. Raincoast is a science-based environmental charitable organization dedicated to protecting the lands, waters, and wildlife of coastal British Columbia. Uh, and they do this through their mandate, which is to investigate, inform, and inspire. Right. And alongside of them this season is Take a Stand, uh, the organization that I'm super lucky to be a part of. And much like Raincoast, Take a Stand's goals are based on the principle of fostering an informed community of people, which is super topical for this episode. Um, what I really continue to appreciate about Take a Stand is their focus on motivating and empowering young people to protect and conserve the environment through art and through film uh, and youth driven actions, which is super cool, encouraging that continued partnership between art and science. So, um, like I said, today is episode three, nav or, sorry, episode two, navigating the media in the era of misinformation. Uh, and we have two fantastic guests joining us today. We have Ross Reed, otherwise known as Nerdy About Nature. Uh, and we have um, Arvin, or Outside Arvin, you might, or Arvin Outside, is that his username handle? Uh, that's how many of us know him. Um, both of us, both of them will be joining us today. Um, but first we'll bring in Ross, um, have a little conversation. And yes, if you have any Q&A questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. And towards the end of today's discussion, we'll bring both of our guests out and have a little conversation with everyone who's watching. Um, so a little bit more about Ross before I bring him in. He uh, grew up in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains on the unceded lands of the Coast Salish Territory. And he uh, studied biology and film production in Montana, which sparked his ongoing career uh, in outdoor adventure sports filmmaking. And through blending naturalistic observation habits with his background in film and storytelling, mixed with a bit of philosophy and humor, uh, Ross uses various forms of social media to get his conservation message to the masses. 
Uh, and recently he was honored with the top content creator to watch of 2022 from Harvard Sea Change and Pick Action. And you can find his work, uh, um, hold on, pull it up, on his website, nerdyaboutnature.com. Um, and to conclude the intro before I bring him in, I just wanted to showcase one of his TikToks from his page, uh, which are amazing. So I'm going to play one. It's only one minute long. And uh, when that concludes, we'll bring Ross in for our conversation. Common theme that I hear all the time is that it's all right to cut forests down because trees grow back, which isn't necessarily wrong, but just such a shallow mindset, it drives me nuts because yes, obviously trees grow back, but forests are always so much more than just the trees. When we clear cut these original forests to create a replanted crop forest, we lose all of the biodiversity these original ecosystems hosted, everything from the diversity of different tree species at different ages, down to the ferns, the salal, the mosses, the fungi, all the different parts that not only store carbon, but help perform numerous ecological functions that we need to survive. Secondly, while trees do grow back, the kind that exists in an old growth forests grow back on timelines that are simply unfathomable to us puny humans. You know, we're talking trees that grow to maturity over hundreds, if not thousands of years. And when we cut them down, it's not like they're just going to magically be there again in 80 years. So while these ecosystems do have the ability to naturally regrow into healthy functioning ecosystems once again, this is going to require us to either not touch them at all for two to 5,000 years or learn how to adapt our practices to be ecologically in line with these various ecosystems. So yes, trees do grow back, but these ecosystems evolve over thousands of years. And once they're gone in human time scales, that's basically forever amazing okay great i'm gonna bring ross in hello hey wow <laughs> god i talk so fast that's crazy i was going to say i i am um i am jealous of your ability to condense such a complex topic into one minute and do it like well and, and engaging um that was amazing i have another tiktok to play if we have time and and, and it feels right um, but yeah, I just wanted to introduce you. If you want to also introduce yourself, if there's anything else that I didn't cover, um, I'll pass it off to you. Um, yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just stoked to be here. Um, it's funny to, to watch things like that. Cause I mean, I definitely have the ability to talk fast and, uh, thank you for your praise there. It's not something that I particularly really enjoy to do. And when I hear it just like out of the blue, like that, I'm like, Oh my God, that's overwhelming. <laughs> but i'm glad it gets the point across and gets people engaged because that's kind of the whole mission of the the whole thing yeah great well i wanted to ask you can you like tell us a little bit more about your background and how you kind of came to the work that you're doing how did you show up on tiktok um kind of by accident basically by accident it was um kind of a joke that i started out like i've always i i've my background is in filmmaking um, mostly documentary type stuff so I've been like more on the side of like storytelling and I actually <clears throat> spent some time in Australia and have an MBA too like with an emphasis right. in branding and, and stuff so I'm really familiar with the communications aspect of things um, and then have always just been like a huge nature nerd kind of on the side I'm like we'll read textbooks for fun because I find them fascinating and and whatnot so that's just kind of how I've like always spent my time and then this kind of all came about as a, a COVID project really um, I started it as a joke right before COVID, right before COVID kind of um, happened, I guess, occurred. And it was just kind of an opportunity to to do something fun and share some knowledge with people in like a fun, quirky way. And then yeah. it's just snowballed since then. And I think this is a really interesting discussion for me to kind of be in on because like, I, my background is in communications and messaging and talking to people and like, and just communication in general between people and so much of what we're going to be talking about today in regards to like misinformation, disinformation, sort of like different propaganda, um, especially industry back stuff comes down to just like communications and doing it in a crafty, sneaky way um, that can really easily misconstrue the information or like mislead people into believing something that might not entirely be true. Right. Yeah. Well, how, how have you encountered that on the platforms that you were, you were, you were working on? So like TikTok, have you seen um, misinformation spread on TikTok surrounding things that you were talking about? Um, not so much on TikTok, actually, because TikTok's fairly new. Sure. Um, and my experience with TikTok is a little bit um, jaded, I guess. TikTok's actually not my favorite platform to work in. Um, yeah, because they make enough. it really difficult to communicate with people like if 
And the thing that I love about Instagram, for example, is if there's somebody who, like some troll who wants to say something or somebody who wants to debate a point, you can like have really long, well-worded and scripted messages going back and forth. You can actually create right. a dialogue where on TikTok, they don't really allow that to happen. I think the max you get is like 80 or 60 characters in replies. So you end up having to do like multiple replies and then they get sorted based on likes. So then they're not even in order. It's really complicated. If I could talk to some TikTok um people on the back end and try to find a way to fix that. That would be great. But um, yeah. And the advertising structure is different on TikTok where I know like um, there have been ads and stuff that companies have bought industry kind of back companies have, have purchased on, on Instagram and shared those around. Um, but as far as I've seen, I don't think anything like that exists on TikTok yet. Right. Okay, cool. Well, like you said, you, you kind of, fell into this it wasn't uh it was like a, a covid project that that really took off um mm. as your platform has grown in size has your process changed like have have you have you felt like a responsibility uh of educating an audience as, as it's kind of grown over time um yeah it has i'd say the um yeah, like, so a lot of it started in the beginning where I would, like, just know stuff. And, like, a significant portion of it is just stuff that I've, like, read about or kind of know off the top of my head. And then I'd go out and I would, like, be like, oh, I want to say all this. And then I would go, I would do a couple takes of it and be like, oh, I should also mention this and this. So I would, like, say it faster and faster until it was, like, just crammed into, like, one minute. And now I'm definitely trying to make a more conscious effort of, um, uh, of, like having a concise message and one that is like more often trying to be unifying than alienating and one that is like um, riddled with like sources and in-depth information. So like a, a lot of the stuff, like I have sources for that's another thing with social media. It's really difficult to tag sources. I wish yeah. it was the thing where you could like tag links to like specific reports and articles. So you could actually have like a bibliography in, in a sense for everything. Um, cause you can't even really send links back and forth to people or not in the comments anyway. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a difficult medium to be working on, but I definitely try my best and especially more recently have really been putting effort and energy into like getting solid sources and, and moving forward like that. Ross, I had a question about what have you found is helpful in like bringing people together rather than being divisive? Um, I think, I mean, it's all communication, right? Um, nobody here, nobody in the world is a mind reader. I'm so tempted to swear. I'm so, I'm sorry. I've been like casually, <laughs> I started a podcast recently and I've kind of loosened up the reins on the cuss words. And, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry. I'm trying to hold back. Um, I, I think that, um, I think communication is such an important thing because it's all that we really have to bring people together, right? Like nobody can read minds. So, with that communication, there's like, yes, learning how to like, not necessarily eloquently, but like substantially like express your opinions and express what's on your mind and your values and your cares. But the other side of that is like listening to the other party that you're talking to and really listening from a space of empathy and compassion and understanding that they, especially in very kind of politicized issues like environment, um, are often at the polar opposite of what you believe. So it's like, there's space for both parties to exist in being right. And that like, they both believe what they are. Like every man's right in his own eyes. Right. Bob Marley quote, it's classic. Like, <laughs> you can't, you can't tell somebody that they're wrong straight up. The only thing you can do is like express yourself as fully and honestly and openly as you're able to and hope that they um, are coming to that conversation with the same amount of empathy and compassion. And then you kind of meet and find a middle ground. You're able to find common ground with people and able to find the values that like truly unite us because we have so much more in common as a species, as a society um, on this planet than we do like, you know, based on one person's political writing versus the other or what their occupation is or where they stand on electric cars. Like all of that is just like so, I don't know. So like bogus, it's, it doesn't yeah. really matter in the grand scheme of things, but people get so hung up on these things as if like their lives depend on it. And I think it, it takes a, a, an air of humility for us all to just step back from our egos and recognize that like, we're all in this together, you know? Right. Well, I find like in social media, like for me, 
I kind of exist in like my own sphere of influence where like mm. everything that surrounds me is like similar, similar thought process, similar ideology. Uh, when I had a chance to go through your TikToks, I saw there was a few like talking about old growth forests and you did name drop like some politicians and some parties, which I mean are, you know, doing an adequate job of creating policy that actually sustains and conserves like old growth forests, uh, specifically in BC. Um, are, is there like an intention to keep neutrality or are you like, are you worried about cutting off part of your, of your base due to like leaning one way politically? Uh, or do you think that's necessary when addressing these topics? Because I mean, like conservation, environmentalism, just as a movement can be political within itself, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely very politically charged, a lot of the discussions these days. Um, but again, I think I try to like walk that line of being more inspiring to engage people in the act of political discourse, which is ultimately communication it's ultimately people expressing yeah. their values and you know even like regardless of who's in the office like that's they just represent one set of limited beliefs that don't encompass all the little nuances of everybody within society right. so it's yeah. important for people in society to like get out and express those values to the representatives to those people so that they can be heard and ideally in like a functioning democracy be considered in these actions um so yeah like you know i think especially on social media and especially throughout the pandemic and like with everything, like people have become so siloed and hypercharged um, against the seemingly like opposite or like their enemy, you know, like we've been pitted against one another, but like, again, I really do think it's important that we all kind of expand out beyond those echo chambers that we all subscribe to on social media and like follow people you disagree with, like follow people who represent the industry that you like hate, you know, quote unquote. And like, the more you do that, the more you empathize with them, I think like the easier it becomes to recognize that we're all just here on like from our own different paths of life, trying to figure it out together in this hodgepodge of everything that we have in society. So it's like, the more empathy I think we can have towards one another and the like willingness to like work with each other and express our ideas, then yeah. the more better that's going to be in the future. Cause we're going to be able to actually can come to some sort of constructive um, outcome that actually seeks to benefit everybody who's involved. But when you're complacent and you just stay in your silo and your echo chamber and you don't do anything, you complain to the same people who are complaining about the same things, nothing <laughs> gets accomplished. Arian, do you have a question? I have a question, but I was just curious if I could, if you want to pass it to you before I. Makai, go for it. I'm just, okay. I'm, I'm thinking, a lot, I'm digesting what Ross has been saying. It's been. Really I am also digesting. Yeah. I mean, I think like a piece of that because I'm, I'm getting the message of empathy. Like we need to connect with people beyond just like the surface level or what their, yeah. what their political piece is. Um, I mean, like because it's so easy to step back from that and just exist in your own little bubble do you think the pros outweigh the cons when it comes to seeking out information on social media and our changing climate because like i i struggle sometimes with because I can, I can actively see how different individuals different organizations are contributing to an even more tense uh you yeah. know like conversation surrounding different like environmental issues uh in the province do you think it's do you think it's still like a, a, a force for good or do you think it's like more dimensional than that i mean that's a deep question because it is the the powers that be if you will yeah uh, they don't make it easy they don't make it easy to have conversations they don't make it easy to find information and i think generally the way that we've been trained um, as a society over the last like 20, 30 years is very divisive in its demeanor, you know? I mean, even coming from like a Christian rooted um, settler society here on Turtle Island, it's like the roots of Christianity spell it out with like good and bad, right, wrong, right. evil, like pure. And then um, coming into like the way that we operate, even from like um, societal standpoints of like looking at sports teams, it's always like, you know, my team versus your yeah. team winners, losers. There's no middle ground. There's no like sense of compromise. So we're immediately embedded with that mentality when we get into a conversation with somebody. It's like, I'm right. You're wrong here. I'm going to, I'm going to win. I'm going to prove you're wrong by out competing with you on all these different elements. Here are my like fact bombs I'm dropping. Here's my like persuasive argument, but it still doesn't do anything because it creates winners and losers when ultimately that's what has created the whole situation we're in. And the powers that kind of like 
that that are able to like that that exist from this colonial system that we live within um, are set up in a way that they continue to just kind of use that against us. Like the labor. Yeah. there's um there's a meme I saw a while ago that has just like stuck with me because it's like they have what it's something like they have us fighting a culture war instead of a class war or something. Cause it's like, as soon as we look at like, actually like who's in charge of running the, of who's in charge of running these countries, um, the people at the top, like the 1% with all the money who kind of keep things going, keep people bickering back and forth, whether it's loggers versus environmentalists or oil and gas versus renewables. It's like they keep people on the ground bickering back and forth in that same mentality of like winners and losers, one team versus the other good and bad oh, instead yeah. of like looking up and being like, we need to change the systems in which we live in and the people up top, we need to get them out of power so that we can actually create a system that helps everybody regardless of where we work or what we believe or who we vote for. Like none of that really matters in the grand scheme of things. And I think it takes like a lot of, um, I don't know. You have to like really work and really try to like have that empathy and compassion because it's something that hasn't been trained within us as a society. Like nobody's used to having conversations where you feel awkward or uncomfortable. We're taught to, if you get in a conversation where you're uncomfortable, you need to like get out of there, like escape yeah. bail somehow. But like, those are the conversations that you're going to grow in. So sit in it, you know? Yeah. What we need to do. Yeah. Well, you, you, I, I, you couldn't, I couldn't have said it better myself. That is such like a true statement towards the way things are right now, like this divide and conquering of like our government kind of distracting us from what's actually going on by like instilling this belief between like this binary that you're either good or bad. And there's these two yeah. sides. Um, well, and I, and I would like to point out, too, that it's not like government necessarily. Sure. Um, yeah, I should. Yeah, I should say that government's kind of like the framework in which these decisions are made. I mean, my if I was going to poke beef with anybody it's again it's like the it's the one percent it's the it's the people you know often rich white males in this colonial setting who have the and like vested power and money and wealth to where they can have these systems working in their favor often yeah. within the government system because that's just how you get things done in a more efficient manner but like really those are the the people that like yeah that run the run the show more or less yeah Arian, did you have a question? I saw you unmuted yourself for a second before. Yeah, I was wondering, like, particularly as it relates to old growth, like, how can we challenge ourselves to find compassion for, like, violent aggressors? You know, particularly around, like, the RCMP or even, like, loggers taking yeah. matters into their own hands. Because I think when we're, when we're having a conversation, um, it is a bit easier, I think, to, to try and have that empathetic connection and try to, like, put humanity first. But when like your physical livelihood is being challenged, like how can we still yeah. strive for that? Um, I mean, and that's again, like that's one of those complicated issues that gets down to like um, the philosophy behind it, and then like how it's actually like implemented in the real world. I think it kind of comes down to like more Buddhist thoughts and like mentalities of like coming to peace with it, like in your own terms. But then like when you're in a situation where you're being violently threatened, then it's like of course you're going to act and react differently. Um, but even within those larger systems where you have like the, this hyper masculine dominated system like the RCMP that has like been trained through decades to reward that type of negative behavior. Yeah. It's, it's going to like, that's not something that you'll be able to just like come to somebody who's like 40 years old, raised in that environment. That's what they're doing. It's their career job. They've been doing it for 20 years. Like you're not going to be able to come at them on a logging road and say something that's going to break that. Like that takes like larger societal change that ultimately comes down to like their family life, their communities that they live in and slow changes like that. So it's like, yeah, on like when you have those confrontations, like there's not really much I think you can do other than just like um, try to, like look out for your own safety, your own personal health and like reduce traumas and triggers and try to find a way to navigate that situation at that moment in time. But then like on a deeper subconscious philosophical level, I think we all need to be embodying these um, welcoming um, more like soft values, I guess, on a societal level so that we can slowly break down, um, you know, systemic things as root deep rooted as the RCMP. Like, yeah. 
Because that's that's not going to be a thing. I mean, even with like all the talk, all the talk happening right now with like defund the police and everything, it's like even if you were to do that and enact something, like you still have that culture of people, that demographic in that age who have been raised like this. We need to change the way people are being raised. So it's such a longer, deeper issue that we can't just like fix with like a conversation in the woods. Sure, but like ultimately, these changes start with conversations. That's awesome. Thank you for that. Um, I have one more question for you before yeah. we uh, will transition on. And I just wanted to ask just a general question, however this hits your ear. Um, how can we equip youth with skills to navigate online spaces that can often be dominated by misinformation and like alternative facts? Like how can we find like a basis of truth when like trying to educate ourselves online? These are huge questions. I don't want you to feel overwhelmed at all. I apologize. This is just wow. in my mind. I feel like you have like that seated <laughs> insight. Yeah, that um I'm not entirely sure if I re really have an answer for that right now. No, I, especially not. especially for the youth like and when you say youth like what ages just, like, you young here. young people people who are, are trying to figure out what their political compass is or how they want right. to engage with society um i mean like i think what you partially right. said before is is so true like you can't just exist within your own stream of conscious you need to look at people who you disagree with you need to look at like yeah. the whole spectrum to like kind of create a basis of being informed overall so i think you kind of answered it already but i was just curious um well, to, to expand on that, I would say that, like, if, like, yes, it's about listening to people from different sides, different perspectives, for sure. Um, but you also need to do so, like, listen to sources that are, like, regulated and right. calm and calculated and people who are thoroughly expressing their ideas, um, especially on, like, the right wing side of things and the left. I mean, both, like, the radical sides of both ends of whatever spectrum, you get a lot of people who write opinion pieces um, and things that are very harshly worded, and it comes out with this, like, a, an air of, like, there's a lot of um, persuasive communication used within those sorts of narratives that if you're not used to that and you think that is, like, a very fair and unbiased paper or perspective, that's going to skew your perception. I think that there's a right. lot of that happening right now. Um, my generation, not to like age myself, but like, um, and especially in the science world, it's really great. Like, I, I love the fact that you can read a paper that is like written to be as unbiased as possible, just stating the facts and like summaries and, and you can get like the gist of what this means without it being overloaded with like any bias. And then like the more you kind of like read into that, you can make connections to like what the implications of like this research says mm -hmm. to this research. Um, and kind of go from there. So it's like growing and forming your own opinions through scientific fact um, and research as it's been done. Um, and, and again, when you talk about that, it's like peer reviewed, um, publicly funded, like openly funded things. Like if you can't find the funding source for an article, like it's probably privately yeah. funded and it's like that for a reason because it's backing up something that the industry wants so there's like yeah. again it comes down to like just experience and doing this stuff and like learning how to do it slightly better each time um, but I think like first and foremost just being able to identify the voice that is being used um, in the information you're getting and recognizing that like everybody not I mean yeah everybody is going to have bias one way or the other um, and it's one thing to like express yourself in a way that is like free from bias or at least like open to dialogue and another way then to come at it like some sort of like right wing pundit who's just like yelling into a microphone, like obviously aggressive, obviously yeah. biased and misleading. Um, so it's yeah, I think that's probably the best starting point. Um, there's so many different levels we could go into with that even because. Yeah, like one of the things that concerns sure. me is is kind of like an overall like censorship thing when you have like we saw during the pandemic, like the the censorship um, or like fact checking bodies that were just like controlling what people could say. Yeah. Uh, and then it's like, who's who's regulating those fact checking bodies? Where yeah. is that coming from? Um, and then ultimately, like, you know, that comes down to not necessarily even government, but like 
a company, a privately owned fa- company like Facebook, um, which is like, I don't know, are we trusting the corporations with with censoring our, right. our information and saying what's right and what can be heard and can't be heard? I think that's just as, as dangerous. Um, but at the same time, like if you open up to where anybody can say anything, then you get, you know, equal weighting in the voices from people all over the spectrum who um, aren't necessarily mature enough of, of communicators to have their voices listened to in that same same level. So I don't know. It's it's a complicated complicated issue to say the least. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that um, that answer. I know that was a complicated question. It was kind of a big big question. Um, and we can have a little bit more of a conversation towards the end of the episode. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to express my thanks again for your insight and we will invite you back in, uh, in like 20 minutes and we can yeah. have a little Q and a session, but yeah, thank you for this. Sounds good. This uh, Sorry like, for like the before, uh, nerdy about nature.com. Check out his fantastic work. I will see you uh, in a little bit. Thank you. Cool. Bye. Right. I will let Arian introduce our next, oh, actually, go ahead, Arian. Or is this me? Do you want me to do this? All right, hello. So uh, before we introduce our next guest, we should talk about the Thought Exchange. Uh, this is a survey of questions that we've put together that we encourage everyone who's watching uh, to check out. You can scan the QR code or go to tejoin.com and type in the code 852-349-825. Um, and we hope to gather some of you the answers to these questions from the viewers to have a have a look at the data and maybe present some of the um, answers that we get towards the end of the season. Um, but yes, yeah, so without further ado, I'll pass it on to Arian. Awesome. So I'm just going to introduce Arvin quick. Um, as an educator and photographer, Arvin is interested in critically examining the incentives and structures around the world that drive power, access, and policy, and the erosion of traditional ways of imposing Sorry, traditional ways of knowing and being. He attributes this focus to the juxtapositions he observed as a young adult while working and traveling through different regions and industries. With his partner, he recently authored the Oxford Theory of Knowledge course book, which foregrounds the politics of knowledge and makes power relations visible through a decolonial lens. Since immigrating to Canada, he has worked on four documentary teams focusing on it on Indigenous sovereignty, direct action, and land defense. Uh, so now let's uh, give a warm welcome to Arvin. <laughs> Hey, Arvin. What's up, man? Hey, y'all. Arvin and I actually in the same building almost, I think. It's right over there. Yeah, across <laughs> the wall. Uh, I'm also going to add uh, Arvin's website. If you want to go take a look at some of the photos uh, he's taken, uh, really, really inspiring and phenomenal work. Um, but Arvin, just kind of getting started, could you tell us a bit more about your work and how you got started in the media space? Uh, wow, thank you. Um, yeah, by accident, you know, um, not by design of any form. Um, I was here as a, as a new immigrant, um, didn't have a work permit. Uh, something huge was happening pretty much on my doorstep. And I went out there just trying to get a sense of what was going on and, and be here in a good way and see if there was any way I could support or, or, or learn. And... Um, when I first started taking photos, I, was, I remember this very clearly. I didn't want to, to post them on my own page. You know, I didn't want that visibility or anything. And I kept trying when things were happening really fast. I'm talking about the Fairy Creek blockades. When things were happening very fast, I kept trying to get my photos put out there by other people, you know, by big, bigger pages. And then people were saying, you know what, just do it yourself. Uh, and so I started doing that. And that's how I got started, just trying to put the put the news out there. Um, and then it became a bigger thing slowly. And more people started sharing it. And then I got contacted by a, 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 a producer from the U.S. Uh, working with PBS. And he was like, will you film for us while we can't come there because of COVID? Will you be out there? Will you be our eyes? And I was like, sure. And that's pretty much how it started. Um, and it's just been, you know, this whirlwind, uh, unexpected, surprising thing since then. Awesome. And so since we're this episode, we're talking about misinformation uh, and social media. I'm wondering what steps have you taken in your own work to portray frontline movements authentically? Wow. Um, that's a really big question. I, I 
I think, you know, if I was being honest, like I've always tried to be authentic to myself. I don't know if there's a more relative or, or absolute kind of frame of reference um, in terms of my authenticity versus, you know, what's actually happening. I don't know if I've, if I've managed to gain a perspective that's risen above myself and above my context. Um, but I think, you know, it's a big, it's a big topic when we talk about perspectives and social capital and, and visibility on social media. Um, and a lot of the, the conversation tends to be around how do we filter, right? How do we, how do we parse through misinformation? How do we, um, you know, get to the truth? And I think a lot of that springs from something that's been called an algorithmic impulse. It, it applies the same logic of algorithms to try to figure out what the truth is. Uh, and in critical theory, this is contrasted with like an ecological um, a kind of way of doing things in which we just maybe trust a little bit that all these different perspectives and, and opinions and, and, and positions will be in relationship with each other. And through feedback, um, you know, maybe self-regulate in a way that's not algorithmic or top down. Uh, so in terms of my, I've just tried to do what feels right to me and what felt right at the time. Uh, and being really honest that this is the way I see things um, and to do right by the people who are in the frame, you know? Um, yeah. Just that they would to treat them with respect. Um, yeah. Sure. And so, you know, they say, I, I, I know you most for your photos and some of your video work uh, and they say, uh, you know, every photo is a thousand words. And so how do you like use your photography to kind of just like put capture the story but also just kind of like spread awareness like what words what are you saying through your photos um you know I, it took me a while because it changes a lot you know um initially when i first started doing this work it was to show how beautiful the reality was of people doing something that they're proud of selflessly and they're taking these risks. And it was, it really was a beautiful space. And I wanted the world to see that, you know, what I was seeing was just how basically in a word, how beautiful it was. And then things changed and they became much more intense and, and the stakes seemed to get higher and, and the violence just was ratcheted up to another level. Um, and at that point, I think, you know, the, the, the person with the camera, I'm not by any means unaffected by what is happening on the other side of the camera. You know, there is a relationship there. And so that does affect you and how you see things. And, and I think it became harder. And I think what I was trying to convey more, it became more actively trying to be destabilizing to status quo. Um, you, you hear this a lot in the, in the media, you know, journalists and, and independents will be accused of being neutral or not neutral or whatever it is. And I think that's a kind of, you know, it's a hard thing to judge neutrality versus a status quo that is already, you know, sided in one direction. So I think uh, something that I've been more intentional about has trying to be like, you know, is this is this number one authentic and honest, but is it also destabilizing? Um, and that's been a, a focus on my work recently. I'm wondering, like, what if any like responsibilities do media people have when movements come knocking on the front door? Is there any obligation that, I mean, like, or at least like, why did you feel compelled to, you know, take action at Fairy Creek and start covering it? Yeah. So I got involved there. Like I was there watching and, and kind of being there much before it became a big social media spectacle. And so I had relationships with some of the people there. Um, and I was impressed with them you know, and the things they were doing. And I'm a new immigrant to Canada and I, I couldn't take some of the risks that they take. Uh, though in, in, in recent times that has changed a little bit. But um, I just wanted to show what they were doing. It just, you know, like they became friends of mine and, and it was important to show what they were, you know, what they were doing. Um, and so it didn't feel like I was compelled or anything. It actually felt pleasurable. You know, it was like I was, I was in community and I was in, I was doing these things with people and it felt good. Uh, and then towards the end, when I started getting burnt out, 
I couldn't wait for this thing to end. You know, I, I kept saying this is my last trip out here and I don't want to be here anymore. Um, and I kept waiting and, and I felt like I couldn't leave. Um, and when it was finally over and, and things had, though it's not over, it's, it's still, who knows what's going to happen in a couple of weeks. But um, when things start to, to slow down and then eventually stop, maybe pause, maybe stop. I was very happy. Uh, and I, and I got to like, take a break. Um, yeah. I have a question. Um, through my own experiences doing documentary filmmaking um, and through my time, like I, I did some legal observation at Ferry Creek as well. It is very like evident to me where there can be intentional gaps of information, uh, especially on like through major Canadian news agencies and they're like under reporting of critical issues surrounding the environment and even blockade work. Um, what are your thoughts on these gaps? What are your thoughts on them intentionally leaving critical details um, and, and narratives and stories completely out of the process uh, to withhold that from the public? Right. Makai, do you mean gaps in mainstream media? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a really, it's been a real problem. Uh, personally, that's been something that I've, I've noticed and struggled with. I'll give you an example. When I was in the early days, I think this is in, in May, May last year, you know, it was the first time the, the law enforcement and the media had encountered a tree sitter in this Fairy Creek saga, right? It was late May. Um, it was after the police had gone through uh, and, and kind of ripped out Keiku's blockade and they'd actually left and everybody had left and then industry had gone in and counted these tree sitters and they were like, oh, hold on, there's a whole, you know, another blockade in here we didn't know about. And then everybody has to come back. RCMP comes back, media comes back. And we were out there and all the mainstream media were out there with their, you know, tripods and, and big, like, you know, rigs. And uh, there was this tree sitter pony about 300 meters away um, on this pretty extraordinary, technically sophisticated sit suspended between two seat, uh, two trees. Right. And, um, you know, the mainstream media, all of them, you know, all of them, like, I'm not going to take names because they were all, anybody who was there, this was their, this was uh, what they were doing. They didn't even try to get a word in with that sitter who'd been up there for five or six days, who had been, you know, harassed, threatened with rubber bullets and tear gas, whatever it was. Uh, they didn't even attempt a conversation with them. Instead, they kind of lined up their tripods about 300 meters away. There was an exclusion zone. We weren't allowed to even get close to the sitter. Uh, but some of the independents shouted and tried to have a conversation and filmed it. And all these mainstream folks, they were up there and they, they took a soundbite from the media um, liaison officer, right? The RMO of the yeah. RCMP. And then they packed up and they were like, okay, we're done. We want to get home now, you know? And it just felt a little bit disappointing. It was exactly one of those gaps. And I can understand that they probably had things to get to and whatever, and it's a long day. But the stakes felt high enough to justify some inconvenience, you know? Um, yeah. And, and especially to honor the work of that person, regardless of whether you agree with stopping the logging or not. Like this is a person who's lived in a tree sit for five days and taken some pretty extraordinary risks with their time. You know, it, it, it just we respect another human being. I think it's worth listening to what they have to say. And I think they deserve a platform. And anyway, so yeah, that was a pretty egregious thing in my view. Uh, and it's and from that moment on, it just, I kept noticing these gaps and it became disheartening. And it was one of the reasons I kept going out there was because, you know, there was a lack of uh, a lot of things not showing up. And then eventually many more independents came on scene and it yeah. became a much bigger thing. And I was like, you know, this is great. Now, now it's a whole ecology of, of, right. of opinions and positions. That was that was my experience as well, because I, I had always known about misinformation, especially just like our the 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 noise we get from like the U.S. politics and how that kind of spills over into Canada. I, we we hear about misinformation, but it was it was my experience as well, seeing like these big news agencies kind of direct the camera in a specific place and avoid everything else when I was working there as well, where I was like, oh, whoa. So this is like every step of the process. There's something going on. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you yeah that, that was that was that was great. Thank you for your insight, um, Arian. Yeah, uh, I just kind of had one last question before we transition into our our Q and A. Um, but Arvin, you know, I was out there with you at, at Fairy Creek last week, um, and we had a lot of. I feel like we had a couple of conversations about this. But like, what? How can we equip our youth with the skills to navigate online mm. spaces? Um, you know, where it can often be dominated by fake news and misinformation. Yeah. 
you know, I heard your I heard the first part of this interview um, with Ross, and I and I liked his answer, and I think um, it's a big question, and and he was really upfront with saying he doesn't have an answer, and and it's a big topic that a lot of people are working on. So mine is just you know I'm going to throw out my opinion for whatever it's worth. Um, yeah. It's not a researched or, or studied opinion, um, but it's just that social media creates this uh, illusion of proximity, right? That you know in such intimate detail, you can feel and you can see what's happening so far away. And at the same time, there's this illusion of urgency that something needs to happen immediately um, or everything's going to be terrible. And those two things combined create this weird rush, you know, it's it's like a mob mentality, it's cancel culture, it's an echo chamber, it's everything. And um, a lot of nuance is lost, and a lot of demigods kind of come in and occupy the space, and they're like, you know, I'm going to tell you how it is, and, and you can trust me kind of thing. That's never stated, but it's implied. And I think um, what I really hope people keep in mind is that that whole space uh, is an ecology, right? And it's in relationship with each other and different things and you have these big platforms and then you have all these little diverse platforms and you have people finding gaps and niches so in the same way we would trust an ecology or we would navigate an ecology we would have to learn all the little things how to approach it i think we're seeing that people have to learn to use it and that's a very embodied thing you know it's not easy to learn you like i'm not going to be able to give a lecture on how to live in a rainforest um and in the same way, I think we're learning continuously how to operate in social media in this space, Twitter and Instagram and, and whatever. Um, but it's what I, I guess to kind of sum up what I was saying, I think there are these um, impulses to regulate. You know, we're seeing that now with the government, with Bill C-10. I think we chatted about it just briefly just now. I hope I got the name right. Bill C-10 will regulate social media um, and... Schools are trying to equip students with critical thinking and different things. And I think these are all part of the same impulse that got us into this mess, which is how do we control things? And, and you know, I, I don't know how much Russian meddling has had an influence in Brexit or elections. You know, there's been, there's been research that's been done about Cambridge Analytica and how I, I'd like to know conclusively how much damage was done by this misinformation because misinformation does seem a little bit like a really convenient boogeyman that everybody can agree on, but also everybody can weaponize, you know, to, to, to distance, a, distance a position that's inconvenient. And so I would hate it if somebody was to become the arbiter of disinformation. That person would have ultimate power. You know, would I trust the state to decide what is disinformation? No way. You know, would I trust really big platforms? No way. So we're, we're stuck in a situation when really it falls to individuals. And I hope it's not just individuals learning to like use their critical thinking. I hope it's also like learning to, to like work in relationship, um, to build community, to listen to elders and peers and, and things like that. Um, and at the same time, I know that's not satisfying because we do get stuck in echo chambers and silos and things like that. Um, yeah, that's, that's the best I can offer you. I know it's not a, it's not a soundbite answer, sadly. I think one thing about just like the, the changing media landscape is that we're running out of, of easy answers, right? Those might be the ones that do well uh, and blow up and get people to engage and get reactions out of people. But I think, you know, as the problems we're facing become more and more intersectional and we yeah. need everyone's help to combat them, particularly in like climate change sense, like we're this isn't the time for easy answers. Mm -hmm. uh, it really does take all of us coming together and like Ross was saying to, to you know, connect through empathy and conversation to really unpack these issues. Um, and so just, you know, something to keep in mind that, you know, maybe we shouldn't look for easy answers because typically those are the sure. ones that can be manipulated the most. Yeah. Yeah. And and on that point, I guess I'll just break what I just said. And one easy answer, <laughs> just because I'm tempted now. <laughs> uh, one easy answer is that, um, you know, neutrality should not be fetishized, fetishized to the extent it has been. Like there's a lot of this, what is neutral, what is not, what is true, what is false. And I think one, one frame of analysis, what is destabilizing, what is destabilizing and what is stabilizing? Um, this is easier to glean at, at kind of at a glance. And I think we need destabilizing narratives, you know. Um, and what I mean by that is those that challenge the status quo that is essentially stacked in one direction. And 
and there's this I, I forget what it was but you know when we when we start looking at cinema and we see people looking at uh you know making documentaries that that might not be historically faithful right they might not be true exactly what happened but they might be useful in the sense that they elevate certain narratives that have been deprivileged right and then you get like this redemptive storytelling that is not necessarily faithful to like some kind of fact but it is useful for the place we find ourselves in uh and that's also a position that is very easily manipulatable right um, I, i i hope i use the word right there but that's a that's a position that is dangerous because then you have basically like you know you, you what we're saying is there is no absolute frame of reference um it's just like a little bit of a free for all so i think within that within those two positions there's some balance there that we can find awesome yeah thank you for um for saying that and for you know sharing your experience with us so now we're going to bring ross back and we're going to open it up for a q and a so audience members um yeah, like the banner says, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Please We'd love to hear them. Um, yeah. In the meantime, um, hold on. I had some other things written down. I wanted to ask either of you uh, or both of you, what is your process for fact-checking information, your information before making work or releasing uh, things publicly? Um, just making sure I have good sources from the get-go sure <laughs> creating and, a foundation and like and if i read something in like a an op-ed or an article or something um from any source um i try to check out the actual sources that they sourced that they cited and if they don't cite anything then i don't quote that article because that's like again if there's if there's no factual basis to what somebody's saying or they don't have a way to prove what they're saying and it, then it's just opinion and yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, pretty much the same, Makai. I I don't. I I know Ross probably uses a lot more facts and data in his work than I do in mine. Sure. Um, but when I when I do rely on or use facts, then it's always just checking sources. Yeah, making sure those are verified. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we have one question from the audience from Vanessa. Oh, here we go. What are your top three news outlets? For getting information about local environmental issues slash discussions i would say the narwhal is probably my first one that came to mind there they do good they do great stuff i love what they do um cool. and then other i i look a lot to um other conservation um organizations like rain coast and, and people that will like post new findings new reports new studies i feel like that's the most authentic like you know, get it straight from the horse's mouth thing rather than it being synthesized through some mm. thing that's been dumbed down to put on the Globe and Mail, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the bigger the bigger um, and more famous a platform gets, the less I can count on them. Um, and so I think um, I'll go with a slightly different answer here. I think like cultivating a small network of independence um, because I've even, you know, even the narwhal, I've been, I've been a little bit disappointed sometimes with with some of the coverage, and mm -hmm. and um, I think like really true courageous things are only reported out um, by people who don't have to answer to those vested interests, right? Of 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 funding or grants or whatever it is, or, right. or under pressure. When you're small, you don't feel pressure the same way as you do when you're bigger. Um, and you have less to lose it at least that might that might be true some of the time so yeah a network of small independence um being really close to the ground i think i think part of this we're approaching this problem a little bit like consumers you know like what's the menu from which i can choose the tastiest right. new source and i think um it, some, it requires work you know we have to work for our truth basically i love that analogy yeah you can't find good nutritious food at any old supermarket. You got to go to the, the farmer's market. Like, <laughs> got to shop small, shop local. Within the context of Fairy Creek, I even saw that how at a certain point it kind of broke from one major news source into 
a bunch of individuals who, I mean, that's, that's who I ended up going to. You were one of them or just many different uh, photographers and other journalists that had been on the ground and had to kind of create their own network of just smaller, like civic journalism, as opposed to all funneling in through one organization or one, under one brand. It was kind of like on an individual to individual basis. And I, I felt like that information was certainly more accurate and true to what was going on on the ground. Yeah. Makai, can I add to my answer? Yeah. Um, yeah. And just to just touch off what you said, there is this one of the, one of the kind of features of a, of a kind of colonial society using that for phrase very, very broadly um, is that, you know, we have these specializations, right? Like science has special reporting rights on, the natural world and truth and and the media has special reporting rights on what's happening in news and i think in a more decentralized way of doing things you know this is a pretty artificial relevant relatively recent thing where you have these specializations which kind of you know you go to for these things i think there's something to be said for media you know citizen scientists such as ross and, and yeah. different folks doing their work on their platform a media you know citizen journalists you know people who do the work locally um and we don't trust or necessarily rely on at least um the big kind of news funnels right yeah no that's a good yeah i, I totally agree yeah and to kind of add and elaborate off, off that i think we're at a really um interesting time where people are able to synthesize different bits of information from different mediums and like um you know how does science impact culture impact society instead like or in the past you know those have always been two like very different things you have like business versus science and science needs to prove that business doesn't or shouldn't be spraying ddt all over the place you know because business takes the lead so like i feel like we're at a place when we're able to kind of hopefully um kind of mesh and meld these different mediums together so they aren't as specialized and we can create kind of a more holistic picture to how we're operating amongst the world yeah, I had a question for Arvin. Um, it, in a lot of the stuff that you've been doing, like a lot of the reporting stuff um, on the ground, and even with like people that you've worked with, have you noticed any bits of like, um, what do they call it, shadow banning or like censorship or like things on where like your posts will get taken down for like offensive material or how does that impact the the truth of what's coming out from like sources like this on the ground? True. Yeah. 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 No, very, then, very uh, good question. Like spot on. Like, you know, it's a real problem. There is shadow banning. There is, um, you know, the, al the, the algorithm, whoever, whatever that means, right? The powers that be who control what we see. Uh, it may not even be deliberate. It might just be some kind of like, you know, weird complex logic that arises out of social media. Regardless of whether it's deliberate or not, there is a filtering that happens and we do get shadow banned. And, and um, you know, and just to give you an example, like I have something on my Instagram. I posted it like six months ago. Instagram took it down within like 12 hours. I appealed it. And then they said, OK, we have seen your appeal and we have agreed with you that it doesn't violate our guidelines. And we have restored it, but it's not restored. It's still down. Right. I can still see it. It's just there's no way there's no like customer service. Like I'm not paying Instagram, so I literally have no control. Right. I can't appeal it. I can't report the problem. It could be a bug. It could be deliberate. It was a pretty intense thing that I, you know, I, I can imagine why they wanted to take it down. Um, it's inconvenient to a lot of, uh, you know, vested interests, but there isn't a mechanism by which I can appeal it or like, you know, there isn't, there isn't any relationship there. You know, Instagram is just like an mm -hmm. overlord uh, because we don't pay them. We're the product. And that's happening over and over. I think um, there's blockchain platforms now that are, you know, coming up that are a bit clunky and inconvenient, they're slower, but eventually I hope that those kinds of decentralized um, media platforms will be the future uh, when they get fast enough. Yeah, I mean, because so much of that is like, yeah, controlled. It's like nobody wants to pay for the service that they initially got for free, so then they have to reach out to advertisers to pay for it, but the advertisers, that just puts them further in bed with those advertisers to suit their needs rather than the needs of the users. And then, yeah, there's no phone number you can call. You can't even email anybody. Like Meta has just turned into this faceless beast that nobody can even contact. Do you do anything on Twitter? Are there any other like kind of public easy access 
ways I'm, to I'm too slow people. for Twitter. <laughs> it's yeah. like all the cool people on Twitter. I'm not. Um, I know I'm not yeah. on Twitter either, but I know people use it. So I was yeah. just. <laughs> yeah. I will. Um, Is yeah, that a I think, reliable uh, source? Twitter is a great place for news. I get, a, I see a lot of things. Again, it's subject to those filters. You know, I just saw there was a doctor um, in the U.S., pretty high level doctor saying something about COVID just got deplatformed. So, um, you know, it's, it's just a bit of a, I don't know. I don't know who we should trust to have these, to make these decisions. Elon Musk just bought 10% of Twitter. Did you see that? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, and that's, that's an interesting discussion too that I would love to hear your thoughts on. Like, because of everything that we saw through the pandemic, but especially in the last six months with people being deplatformed, silenced, banned um, for having opinions that different from like the narrative, like, yeah, COVID is like a global pandemic issue, but how does that translate to like smaller issues of like, uh, you know, infrastructure with like pipelines and things that impact the status quo of the, of the industries that kind of run run the game on how our societies function these days. Hmm. Like what's going to happen? I, I'm just opening that up. Anybody in the comments want to say like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whew. I mean, I honestly think like what I'm concluding from the conversation is that it is incredibly dimensional. You know, there isn't one, this is how we solve it. It's yeah. more so through the pursuit of trying to, stay informed on a case-to-case -case basis consistently because it's been set up in such a way where we have to bear that responsibility as individuals and i mean for like as from my perspective as like a young person i think that's kind of where we should be pivoting if these systems are just kind of established as the way we are we need to ensure that people like the next generation comes into the world with the critical thinking skills to ensure that they can sift through the noise mm -hmm. and and, you know, through everything that you guys said, come to their own conclusions in a more like cohesive way that incorporates the whole spectrum um, and recognizing like following the money, following the motivations of all these different mm -hmm. people and organizations and leaders uh, to establish something that is is more than just a bias. And it's also just, you know, it, it has a basis in truth, has a good foundation. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that that's like a really important skill to cultivate because because um, like for sure, misinformation and disinformation is a massive problem these days. But I also think it's a fine line when we allow big either corporations or government to have censorship control over who gets to say what. Because I mean, right. even in this discussion, you know, we're talking we've mentioned quite a bit about Fairy Creek to in some people's eyes, um, that seen as like a threat to infrastructure and business industry as you know as is right now so it's like maybe in like 10 years will we be able to have a public discussion streamed over the internet about this conversation is that something that like depending on who gets right. regulatory control over where and what we're able to say um is a really important heavy question so i think um it relies a lot on on the individuals being able to make choices on where they're getting their information what they're seeing and what they're saying so that we can like take away power from those bigger sources that are focusing on misinformation and disinformation that like the government or whoever um, aims to regulate you know like we need to take it upon ourselves to to do the vetting on our own way mm -hmm. in our own way on our own terms um, mm -hmm. so that it's not like outsourced to a third party that controls it all for us because that's i think really dangerous yeah. Yeah. Arian, what are you thinking? I'm thinking that I've been loving our discussion so far. Um, and maybe if there is just one last thing that our guests would like to share with, with the audience, this has also been yeah. recorded. So um, for anyone watching this, whenever they're watching um, about some, yeah, final words on misinformation and using social media for good. Hmm. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll, I'll go first on this one. I think, um, like I've just, I just, I opened this conversation just between us. Remember I said I had deactivated my Instagram and I've deactivated it for, for various reasons because I just felt it was a very hard space personally and, 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 uh, to just be bombarded and, and, and thinking about. So 
I don't know. Sometimes it feels like the real work isn't on social media. And sometimes it feels like social media is so important in reaching out hearts and minds. And I don't know exactly where I stand yet on that. Um, but just to, just to say that there is a, a real attention, attention economy um, and it has material impacts, right? If we think about fundraising and, and where, you know, how we generate funds online. And, and, and so it's not true that um, sometimes people are saying, you know, scarcity is a myth and scarcity is just a mindset. It's a, it, the, scarcity exists in very real ways, including online and social capital really influences it. Uh, and so a lot of the work we, we see, and, and I've, I've struggled with being a social capitalist myself um, and what that means. So it's just to keep that in mind, you know, as we, as we work to destabilize and deconstruct the various forces of our time, whatever that means, right? Capitalism, patriarchy, colonialism, like social media shouldn't get a pass. And sometimes it feels like, um, you know, we're harnessing one weapon to do a greater good. But I think, uh, I think social media itself, you know, for young people, especially navigating their own mental health and, and how they, how they, how they, um, how they themselves are impacted by social media. I think it, it would just be really great for us all to be critical um, without being Luddites. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I agree completely. I think that's amazing. Those are amazing words to end on. Social media is, um, it is a tool, but it is also a very dangerous one. And I think like we're, as humans, you know, we're used to talking to each other face to face. We've evolved to talk to each other face to face, to live in small communities, to mingle with one another. And the more isolated we become just in front of our devices. Um, yeah, it's not only bad for our minds and our brains and our mental health and, and all that we need to kind of survive as individuals, but it also causes rifts throughout our communities that in some cases are irreparable. So I think it's one that we need to be really cautious with well thank you both so much for that conversation <laughs> a little bit shell-shocked <laughs> yeah. I, I i don't yeah I, it's hard to pivot because it's it's yeah it, we could talk about this for like hours and hours and hours mm -hmm. um i also just because we're, we're going a bit over time i wanted to just ask you guys um do you have anything you wanted to plug so you have a chance to just like shout out you have like uh, other than your website because we do have both your websites here. Um, we had shown them before, but if there's like I don't know, Arvin, if you want to show your Instagram handle, <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, it's in my name. It's it's it it should have been there. I'm back on Instagram now as of as of 24 hours ago. So who knows for how long? Instagram won't let you deactivate it within a week of activating it. So right, um, at least for a week. <laughs> but let's see. Really? At least caught in for a week. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, and check out uh, Ross's podcast on Spotify. Yeah, the podcast is is a new venture I'm getting into, um, just because a lot of these topics and conversations are ones that, like, I struggle to fit into one minute of speed talking on Instagram. Or no, I really prefer to not do that anymore. So I'm trying to have more longer form conversations with people, kind of about all this. Just get into uncomfortable conversations from time to time and see if we can learn and grow from it. So fantastic. Yeah. This Amazing. has been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been so nice being here with you, Ross. Uh, yeah, I, likewise. Hope, I hope everybody subscribes to your channel. I love it. It's one of my favorite places on Instagram. I oh, follow you from my personal account somewhere. Um, yeah, I see all your videos. They're great. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And I actually just released one yesterday for those watching. Um, about some recent misinformation and kind of like spins that industry um, is trying to put on some stats and numbers that's just like cherry picking stuff. Um, it's a nine minute video. So I don't know, grab a snack and sit Check down with that for a bit. But um, yeah. yeah, but thanks, Arvin. I appreciate that. It's great, great seeing you face to face and hopefully we can connect in real life sometime. There's no sense. Thank you, Arian. Thank you, Makai. Yeah. yeah Thank wise. you both. Great. I will. Okay, cool. That was easy. Um, now I will pass it on to you, Arian, but I just wanted to quickly mention uh, once again, thank you so much to our two guests and everyone who uh, tuned in for this episode. And I just want to shout out our next episode, episode three of Coastal Insight Seasons 3. Uh, the topic is art as a tool for change. Um, now we did have a little blurb about that, but I kind of just want to make it sit as it is. Uh, for those watching, I'm sure you can interpret that. I'm glad we kind of had this conversation as like a foundation uh, before moving into using art to be productive and to inform 
the public about certain things. I know both of us have done that. Me and Arian have made projects uh, using using film, using our devices to to create work um, and kind of to try to instill that ethic of ensuring that we come from a basis of facts uh, to, you know, do nothing but keep, keep uh, a basis of education going for the public. So, yeah, thanks again to everyone who tuned in and who's watching. I'm going to pass it on to Arian. Awesome. Thanks, Makai. Um, quickly, I just want to speak to uh, an upcoming, well, an ongoing opportunity for uh, young people out there um, from Raincoast. Uh, we're looking to showcase the many inspiring youth-led projects that promote education, stewardship, and conservation of the local wildlife, habitats, and indigenous cultures of coastal British Columbia and the transboundary Pacific Northwest. Your project would be featured in our virtual event that will bring together other inspiring youths doing incredible work in their communities and a rich network of professionals working to protect and sustain nature. So this is part of the Raincoast Student Innovation Challenge, which is uh, a joint initiative between Raincoast and Take a Stand for Take a Stand Youth for Conservation. Um, the themes that you could do your project around, uh, well. You, are the following. Um, theme number one is local wildlife and habitats of coastal BC. Theme two is First Nations presence, cultures, and longstanding history on the coast. Theme three is climate change in BC. Theme And the final theme is human connections and impacts. Um, and so I was actually last year's uh, student innovation contest challenge winner. Um, it was <laughs> Thank you, Makai. And so I made a video, um, but there are many ways that you can submit your projects, um, videos, presentations, or other creative expressions. Like uh, I think we had a group create a little play that they they filmed um, or just otherwise presentations, written work, um, podcasts, et cetera. There are lots of ways for you to capture your, um, your project. Um, there are a couple of, of, limits on that. Like I think the video can only be like up to five minutes, but you can check it out at raincoast.org uh, slash innovation challenge for more information. Um, but it's for students grades three through three through 12. Uh, and there will be prizes awarded ranging from a stand up paddleboard to prize packages from Heli Hansen, Patagonia and Ecologist. The deadline to submit is coming up on May 27th at 1159 Pacific Daylight Savings time. And before we go, I want to shout out the thought exchange one more time, um, if you go to tejoin.com and enter in 852-349-825, you'll be able to further engage with us on the show um, and kind of share your thoughts on some further discussion questions. So you can use a QR code or go to tejoin.com and enter in 852-349-825. But I think that's been it for us thank you for thank you everyone for tuning in to coastal insights episode three sorry episode season three episode two yeah we'll see you next week for episode three where we talk about using art as a tool for change this was so good so good thank Thanks, you everyone thank you for joining um and yeah we'll see you next week have a good rest of your afternoons wherever you are or evenings <laughs> anyways yeah have a good have a good night everyone thank you so much take Bye. care everyone